Welcome. My name is Frank Neville. I'm the Chief of Staff here at George Mason University. And today we have with us um, Dr. Patrick Mendes, um, who's a senior uh, distinguished fellow um, and an affiliate professor um, in the School of Policy, Government, and International Affairs here at George Mason University. Um, Dr. Mendes uh, comes to the university with a tremendous wealth of experience both in academia and actually in policy making uh, right here in Washington. Uh, Dr. Mendes uh, served um, both Republican uh, and Democratic uh, administrations here in Washington in senior foreign policy roles. Um, he's an expert uh, in foreign policy in general. Uh, he has a particular expertise uh, in U.S.-China uh, relations. Um, he's a, a native uh, of Sri Lanka, um, came to the United States uh, on an exchange program, um, and has uh, spent his, his adult life and his career um, studying international relations. Um, and he brings a, a, a unique perspective um, to us on these, on these subjects. Now, the reason that I was uh, invited uh, to interview Dr. Mendes today is that he and I were colleagues uh, in the State Department um, many years ago uh, dealing on uh, U.S.-China issues, um, and so he asked me uh, to be here today uh, and, and talk to him a little bit about his new book. Um, his new book, Peaceful War, um, talks about the U.S.-China relationship and provides some very, very thoughtful uh, and creative um, prescriptions for how uh, our two societies and our two governments um, can get along together. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Mendez, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Pleasure to, uh, to be with you here today. And, and if we could maybe tell us a little bit about the title, Peaceful War. Wars are not usually peaceful. Sometimes they're cold, sometimes they're hot, but uh, a, a peaceful war uh, seems almost like a contradiction. Uh, it is, seems like it is a contradiction, but uh, war can take in a different forms. But uh, between the U.S. and China uh, relations, I think uh, we come to a kind of relationship uh, without a war just like uh, with the uh, uh, other countries, uh, they come to some kind of peaceful stage uh, after the war or conflict. Uh, uh, but in Chinese situation is uh, we have been in the past for 200 plus years has uh, good relationships. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, proxy wars uh, in the last uh, 50 years or so. But uh, America and China has always had this uh, a kind of relationship that mutually beneficial. I think it's going to continue to be that way if the, our leaders were very conscious about their policies and their responsive to the each country's uh, uh, um, uh, crisis situation. I think it's going to continue that way, so it is going to be a peaceful in a sense they are not going to shoot in each other to resolve their differences and the conflict that might uh, arise in the future. So what is it that you see that binds the U.S. and China together? What is it that is, that is of shared interest that can prevent confrontation? Uh, it is interesting to see that uh, our founding fathers found the inspirations from the Chinese, uh, which we less known in our uh, learning about American history when I was doing uh, in Minnesota, when I was exchange student, uh, but I never learned about uh, American history that I learned uh, later years. What I found when I doing this research is uh, 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 our wisest and oldest founding father, Benjamin Franklin, uh, wrote in his uh, journals and other writings and autobiography, he wanted to create a new republic that they founded, similar to the, the, the Chinese Confucian society which I thought that was very fascinating. And some of the other founding fathers who are member of the Philadelphia Society, where Pen Benjamin Franklin was the first president and uh, Thomas Jefferson became a president later on. And these founding fathers and also the Thomas Paine especially, 
wrote about China and because of both Beijing and Philadelphia in the same uh, latitude uh, and they have the same weather and then they can have uh, this uh, new civilization, American civilization can be modeled after Chinese. That part uh, kind of intrigued me to uh, explore further. So that inspiration and one time uh, Benjamin Franklin said that uh, yes we gave you a republic if you can keep it uh, and that keep it part is to we need to, to have uh, not all the time that the check and balance system that they provided uh, through Madisonian system. Uh, they also wanted to have uh, this uh, new republic, uh, new American nation uh, to have a certain kind of value system, respect for each other and good neighborly relationship with not only themselves but the, the 13 colonies. So I thought uh, that kind of inspiration uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote about is coming from this uh, Confucian value system that uh, uh, radiate from the Chinese uh, civilization, you know, which I consider is to be the longest and is still survival, survival, uh, survival uh, civilization compared to our republics uh, 230 plus years. But we need to, to find the models we couldn't find it from Europe uh, and we despised the European uh, colonial uh, model of uh, governance uh, uh, and uh, that whole change. But the founding fathers wanted to find another model. So the model they look to is to uh, China. And uh, uh, the interesting part later I found was when we created our new republic, uh, 1784, we sent the first ship uh, called the Empress of China to signal a symbolic and also meaningful message to the British and to the French and the Spaniard that we are not going to deal with you but our commercial relationship is going to be with China. It was sent on a George Washington birthday from the New York Harbor. I thought that the Empress of China sent a remarkable turning point of our republic that said we are going to deal with China, not with the European. We are going to broke away and we kick out the Red Corps or the British and uh, we want to have uh, this uh, new independent country and dealing with this uh, older civilization that can provide the guidance and inspiration for the new republic. So if you fast forward from that 200 years um, to the bicentennial of, of uh, the American Revolution um, and you think back to the situation in China at that time. China was emerging from some very troubled times, was emerging from the, from the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping um, took power um, shortly after that. And ironically, um, the, the country that you could say was, was part of the inspiration for, the, for some of the founding uh, uh, principles of the United States was now um, looking for models of development outside of China. And you talk about Deng Xiaoping um, in the process of reforming China, um, uh, pursuing uh, Jeffersonian ends through Hamiltonian means. So explain a little bit, if you could, uh, that comment uh, and, and the relationship, again, that you see between the sort of political um, development of the, of the two nations over the past, say, several decades. Um. If you were to look at this, uh, the China until 1911 uh, was a dynastic uh, a empire. But that changed when uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen became the father of modern China. It is there George Washington uh, to the Chinese. But uh, during next 50 years or closer to 50 years when until Mao Zedong came in, uh, the country was going, uh, struggling inside the civil roads and the tribal warfares and uh, dealing with the uh, foreign invaders uh, uh, like a British and a f French uh, and also the Portuguese, like they came into the Macau and uh, the Tuco, the Hong Kong and other coastal uh, regions. And uh, then uh, Mao Zedong, actually he wanted to have a good relationship with the Americans uh, and you probably know uh, being in the State Department uh, and the State Department favored uh, but our defense department uh, went to support the Chiang Kai-shek and uh, during that breakaway time and uh, America is going through this is a McCarthyism 
and uh, the American policy makers uh, look to the defense department to the solve the problem rather than to the uh, uh, State Department. So when you look at that one less known part of the American history, it is intriguing to see that Mao Zedong could have been our friend. But uh, throughout that time, and uh, he looked for to the Soviets uh, and Leninism and the Marxist system, and then he went through this is a cultural revolution and tragic events uh, followed uh, during that uh, time. And then, uh, then this is a new kind of leader came in Deng Xiaoping uh, and opened up the China to the world. And I think uh, he was exposed to the Chinese culture and the history and he was educated in Fran uh, for France. And he knew the world a little bit more than, the, than the Mao Zedong did. So I think uh, he wanted to have uh, this is uh, bring back this uh, old kind of uh, relationship that America had with China until the their second uh, first and second opium wars uh, and then the things change because they started to have their own rebellious moment and we focus on our civil wars in uh, mid uh, uh, 19th century you know 1863 when uh, uh, president Abraham Lincoln was our president so when Deng Xiaoping came into the power he wanted to move away from that experiment they had with the Marxist and Leninist system. So he wanted to, I think, he used that uh, American strategy, which means to say that uh, our two founding fathers, uh, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, who led this country's uh, vision and the aspirations of the people through Hamiltonian ideas, look at the uh, central government in Washington and a central banking system and a strong Navy. So he wants to have a strong industrialized America. But on the other hand, Thomas Jefferson, who didn't like personally, philosophically, and politically uh, Hamiltonian way of doing things, Jefferson is uh, pretty much of uh, uh, sentimental kind of American who wants to promote liberty and freedom for everybody and he opposed the centralized government he wants to the state and the local people govern their own affairs and uh, so these differences and that conflict in the American experience with the Hamiltonian country and Jeffersonian aspirations always in conflict that was good for the women movement uh, or to the civil rights movements, to the other movements, because that the freedom gives the changes. So Hamilton wants to have this established and central government, Thomas Jefferson, no, this has to have the freedom to the people. I think that was the American experience. And you can see in Washington, we don't have a huge statues like uh, Thomas Jefferson. We have a big one because we are looking into him, but we have a tiny little Hamiltonian statue in the front of the Department of Treasury. Okay, so we don't want to, to be a greedy, centralized, uh, control freaks uh, kind of a nation, but we are always aspire to be a great uh, nation that uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, wanted to America to be. So I think Deng Xiaoping wanted to use the same strategy, just open up economy have a good relationship with other countries, especially trade relationship, which he did. Now they want to have a strong naval and military force to not only to protect the country, but to also to protect their trade systems. And they want to have a central banking system, state-owned enterprises right now is running the country. So what I think is Deng Xiaoping's looking into the American strategies, which is the Hamiltonian means to accomplish the Jeffersonian ends that America achieved. You know, that that is what I think is their unconscious. So how, how do you think Deng Xiaoping and, and China is, is doing uh, on that score three decades? Um, uh, I think you, you can see this, uh, America become an industrial nation and we overpassed uh, Great, Brit uh, Great Britain because mm -hmm. they are our colonial masters and America become a leading nation in the world. And uh, because of the Hamiltonian 
strategies we had, mm -hmm. but uh, still we are inspired to be uh, more of a Jeffersonian. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, when uh, he, uh, Deng Xiaoping opened up the China, look what happened. We invited them to be in the part, a member of the World Trade Organization under Clinton administration, and their rapid growth expanded uh, uh, unprecedentedly. So now they have a stronger army and a military force, and then uh, they have uh, still keeping their central banking system close and the state-owned uh, enterprises running the system. So you can see that the similarities and parallels are taking place in China. At the same time, th the, the biggest challenge is going to be how can China move toward the Jeffersonian view of a world. Uh, this is going to be the challenge, uh, what I think in the coming years for the uh, President uh, uh, Xi Jinping. And do you think that there's opposition? Do you think there oh, are? Of course, mm -hmm. of course. Look at it in our own experience. Mm -hmm. Founding fathers did not touch two basic and most challenging issues at the, t at the time of the founding. Mm -hmm. They didn't resolve the women issues. There is no equality for them. They took more than 100 years to come to that uh, women's suffrage and the voting rights for women and equality. It didn't take place at the very beginning of the founding of the nation. And then uh, African American, the slaves, uh, uh, were part of not that this is uh, Jeffersonian equality and freedom, even though they are on non-founding documents. E each one is equal rights and uh, unalienable rights for the each American. So those things took time. So they, they took time, but, but the, the world has accelerated. Yes. Uh, in those several centuries yes. since then. And, and China clearly doesn't have centuries to figure out some of its, its key challenges. So uh, President Xi Jinping, you've talked um, about some of the initiatives that he's put in place and some of the policies that he's, that he's starting to uh, enact uh, in his first term there. Um, can he pull it off? Can he, can he start to uh, you know, solve this tension um, and, and bring some of those uh, ideals, um, you know, to the, to the Chinese people? Um, or, you know, is the pace of change going to overrun uh, his ability to, to reform the country? I think by looking at both historically and what is happening in, uh, with uh, President Obama's administration with the U.S. Congress, I think he probably can. Historically, because uh, uh, we have a strong executive and centralized power in Washington. And this uh, interstate relation with the, our 13 colonies, now it's a 50 states, it's always that conflict is going on. Okay? But President Xi Jinping, when he became the chief executive, he had the three roles that he combined very wisely and very brilliantly. One is uh, he's the political leader, he's the state leader, and he's also the military leader. This is uh, similar to our executive. Uh, and uh, our president is the chief of uh, chief commander, chief diplomat, and chief executive. So we have the same kind of power concentration in the White House. Even right now, President Obama wants to, to have uh, govern the country through the executive orders and uh, now we see this uh, Congress I is uh, saying this is a dictatorship and uh, we want to have this uh, the check and balance system. That's why we have a legislators and system. So I think President Xi Jinping also have uh, this kind of forces around him uh, and also from the bottom and from the side coming into play that game. The way he is doing is he directly addressing these issues, especially the corruption issues, is anti-corruption uh, drives that going through. And in the process, you can eliminate certain these undesirable elements that he might perceive as uh, coming uh, counter forces to him. So in that respect, this is uh, anti-corruption mo movement that's going on in China right now. It is a good way to also to have uh, better administration and also to have uh, that uh, concentration of power, and also the 
advocate that is a Confucian value of a virtuous government people, virtuous public servant, virtuous leaders are going to, to run in the country. So in that respect, he's making mark and is popular among the Chinese, ordinary Chinese people. And, and speaking of the Chinese people and ordinary Chinese people, you know, he's talked about Chinese dream and, and sort of tried to paint a picture of, of what success might look like for Chinese society. Um, and you talk about that a, a little bit uh, in your book. And is that a realistic dream? Um, and is that dream in conflict with the American dream? Is this something, are there forces internal to China that are going to, to accelerate or exacerbate frictions um, outside of China, particularly with the United States? Uh, it's, it's very interesting to see they have uh, this is uh, propaganda uh, every city I visited uh, last uh, several years, uh, uh, more than 10 cities I visited, they have uh, these uh, propaganda posters all over about what China dream is. So it is, to me, it is the China dream. It is a collective dream for the entire China as the nation. Not it is particularly focused on individual dream for the every Chinese person, individual. But in uh, our American dream, which is started from the Thomas Jefferson's uh, life, liberty, and process of happiness, uh, that life, yes, you need to, to have a Hamiltonian type of uh, lifestyle. Uh, you need to, to have a live on. You have to work. And then the liberty is a political statement. And you need to, to have a freedom to achieve the pursuit of happiness. So this is the liberty and the pursuit of happiness coming on the concept of individual freedom rather than a state authority or the state imposing that kind of freedom on American people. But the American people as an individual is paramount. It's a liberty and the freedom for the people is paramount in our system, the way we look at the American experience and the, our American philosophy. But in the China, because it is traditionally and historically, Confucian society is a collective society, it is more important to say we as the community or the society as opposed to I. I did this one. Uh, this is individual accomplishments. Uh, uh, you know, that part is where this is a philosophically, these two systems and two ways of understanding two countries and philosophies going to differ. Uh, can we reconcile it? I think yes. If you look at it, our national parks, public transportation system, public universities, uh, and uh, um, uh, other public institutions, even the, our VA hospital. They have uh, this uh, collective identity, collective value system. We have a national park to everybody to enjoy. It's a collective idea. Public schools and uh, public universities like ours, uh, it's as a collective identity. So at the same time, we recognize the individual freedom. I think eventually China has to give that kind of freedom because that the people now who are supporting President Xi Jinping eventually going to demand it. So let, let's talk a little, we've talked a little bit about what's happening inside of China. Um, uh, let's talk uh, for a moment about what China is doing outside of China, um, because that's something of, of great interest to many people here in Washington um, and is cause for concern uh, in, in many quarters in terms of what are Chinese intentions, what is Chinese strategy. Um, and you've talked about the transactional nature uh, of, of Chinese foreign policy versus the transformational nature uh, of, of U.S. foreign policy. And can you explain that um, briefly and also touch on does that create friction um, because we have sort of different approaches and different objectives? Yes, to me, for example, you know, I was born in Sri Lanka, but educated in the British and American system, and uh, most of my life I spent time in Minnesota. Uh, but if you look at it, what the Sri Lankan context, it has uh, thousands of years of relationship with China. 
and also we are also part of this uh, Boston Tea Party uh, struggle uh, because that part of the tea came through Sri Lanka. So now over the years Sri Lanka has always been uh, pro-American governments and supportive of the uh, parliamentary system and the freedom and everything that uh, uh, India is uh, uh, pr uh, practicing itself as the world largest democracy. So China now has become the best friend of Sri Lanka, not only the Buddhist connections they had enjoyed over the years, but because of the Chinese foreign policy of this is uh, uh, what we uh, call the maritime uh, Silk Road that going through the ocean uh, to the South China Sea, to the Indian Ocean and connecting the Middle East and Africa. So if you look at the Sri Lankan context or the African context, China I is very interested in Africa because of the raw materials and other resources and the oil. So they get them and they import it and uh, they also exported the products that China made. But more importantly, transactional nature comes in. All right, we are not just going to export our products, but we come back and build your railroads, uh, their transportation network, your harbors, and the airport, uh, and the schools even. So it is a give and take kind of approach. And they also, uh, in Africa alone, there are over five, uh, 5 million Chinese laborers working there. So what that tells me is uh, they wanted to have their own people working. Sure, they have uh, 1.3 billion people. They have to find employment so they can find the 5 million people employed in Africa. So that is a transactional nature, but uh, they hardly hire the local, uh, uh, try to solve the local problems in the, that the same way that American foreign policy trying to. American foreign policy is uh, also, foreign to our foreign assistance programs, we are trying to develop the same kind of things uh, throughout 50s, 60s, 70s, and onward, uh, initially building infrastructure for those countries. And now they wanted to have the structural adjustment program to change their budgetary system and uh, public spending and so forth. And is they wanted to be transform that society with the hope that eventually people will be free themselves. So that is again this uh, Jeffersonian aspiration, it's a pr democracy promotion idea. That's the Jeffersonian idea that we are going after. So, so let's, um, um, we've, we've kind of warmed up here and we've, we've gone around a number of subjects. So, so let's sort of finish with, with um, a tough question. Um, and there's been a lot of attention uh, given to what's happening in the South China Sea. Uh, and you and I were personally involved uh, in, in an incident in the South China Sea in, in 2001 that went, went very much awry in which we had to help negotiate the release of a, of a U.S. air crew that had been uh, uh, shot or knocked down actually um, through a collision with a Chinese fighter plane. Um, we had to negotiate their release from a, uh, a Chinese uh, military air base uh, in Hainan Island. And fortunately, we haven't seen uh, any incidents like that since. But looking at the situation in the South China Sea and looking at uh, the number of sort of close calls uh, and reports of, of, of frictions um, among you know, U.S. military, Japanese military, Chinese military, all, all you know, operating uh, more and more actively in a, in a relatively small space, um, there's concern um, about where will this lead? And is it just a matter of time until we have another incident like you and I experienced um, in, in 2001? So, so where is this going? Uh, pull out your crystal ball, <laughs> tell us where, where do you think um, this is going? And if you had, um, a minute with President Obama and President Xi Jinping, um, and you could give them guidance on how to avoid um, problems, what would you tell them? I mean, how is it that, where is this going, and, and how do we avoid it becoming um, another confrontation? 
in a minute I can say you need to have a better communication. There is no miscommunication. There is no room for miscommunication at the policy level and operational level at the military. So in order to do that one, you need to have a political dialogue at the one level, which is taking place also. And the secondary level, then you need to have a military dialogue, mill to mill dialogue, which is taking place right now. And a matter of fact, uh, I was watching CCTV last night. They said there is uh, uh, PLA military leaders are in Washington to find, uh, consult with uh, American counterparts in the Pentagon and to come up with a uh, code of conduct how to engage uh, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. That's the exactly what I would say to continue, we need to do it and expand this kind of contacts with the Chinese, not only the government to government level, but the other networks like the academic exchange program and ordinary Chinese visiting here, which I would like to see more, more than the Chinese student in our American universities and the Confucian Institute and so forth. But also American people to go and see China, not from the news reporter, not the uh, uh, lenses of American media, but uh, they want, I, I recommend them to go and see themselves. So that's the one minute answer to the president or to the President Xi Jinping uh, to have a better, better understanding. Miscommunication, misunderstanding can lead into uh, unintended consequences. But now you asked previously, the purpose of your question was the South China Sea and where they are going and this is a different level of conflicts and concerns for the American, uh, American foreign policy. Uh, uh, I think what China is exactly following what America did it in the early part of the 19th century. We told the British and the European colonial powers this is our hemisphere and don't meddle with us. This is came to be known as the Monroe Doctrine. China is exactly using same kind of doctrine telling this is uh, our part of the world, this is uh, our region, we have uh, thousands of years, we use this uh, maritime uh, lines to communicate uh, with uh, other countries uh, like Sri Lanka and uh, if you look at uh, Shanghai's travel, even before Columbus came into America, almost 100 years prior to that one, he has uh, this uh, diplomatic or tributary system, you know, find the respect for the the, the emperor, the, the representative or the son of heaven. Uh, so you can see that cultural context in the Confucian context uh, to Chinese mindset. So therefore, I think they are using that uh, uh, the Chinese version of the Mon Lo doctrine uh, to say we can solve our problem. But again, when you look at it, uh, uh, our relationship with uh, traditional and old friend like the Philippines and the new friend and old enemy like Vietnam. They want us to America to, to come and to counter to the, the Chinese uh, uh, incursion that taking place in the oil rig uh, in the South China Sea. So that is uh, some view as the balance of power in the region. And the Chinese uh, military thinkers and the academics think about no, this is uh, America is encircling uh, the China uh, 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 to, to force China uh, to yield to the Western powers through South Korea, the, uh, the, the our military alliance with uh, Japan and now with uh, more military contact with the Vietnam and also with, uh, uh, with the Philippines and uh, with other countries. So what I think is, uh, Philosophically, China wants to deal with these countries one by one, individually, transactional kind of thing. All right, we'll do this, 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 if you do this, this, this thing to the Vietnamese or the Cambodians or, or the Laotian or the uh, other countries in the region. And uh, America and the Asi Asian countries and also the, the UN said, no, you need to, to have a multilateral framework to address this concern and we need to, to have to follow the uh, law of the sea convention, uh, convention of the UN, uh, which China signed into it, but America did not ratify that uh, uh, the convention. So, which has uh, our own weaknesses, we cannot tell Chinese, 
because we didn't do ourselves to ratify in that uh, law of the sea convention. So there are multiple issues going on, and then uh, the, there are nationalistic sentiment uh, that emerged in and had emerged uh, in uh, Japan, and also in China. Uh, that create uh, also friction and is creating and continue to create, uh, and also because of the what the Japanese did during the World War II and the Nanjing Massacre and other things that took place. Uh, Chinese people, when I talk to them, uh, they remember that. You know, I went to the Nanjing uh, so-called Holocaust Museum. I, it is uh, mind-boggling that uh, another human being or the neighbor uh, coming from the Confucius society or Buddhist two societies can do this kind of thing to the Chinese people. And then I also remind uh, to the Chinese, uh, my colleagues and uh, students and friends, hey, look, uh, we came with the British uh, to support you push the J Japanese away uh, through the Yunnan province and Kunming and our forces during the, that time. They remember that, they know flying tigers, they know about American flying tigers, uh, same as uh, they know about Nanjing massacre. So I am telling the Chinese public or the Chinese colleague and uh, friends, look, America does not have uh, this kind of view to containment policy or go against China. We wanted to have a strong China. We wanted to have a successful China. We wanted to have a open societies that everybody is free. So that is the last element is uh, challenging. So that what I, in the book, I considered is as a social cleft that China is worried about. At the same time, America is an integral part of the Chinese economy and we owe $3 trillion, and we are also concerned about our fiscal cliff, uh, which uh, I uh, talk about in the book. So when you look at it, the all the level and complexity of these issues, both military and the fiscal and social level uh, and the person-to-person -person level, there are a lot of concern. I think they are manageable. I, I am very optimistic about uh, President Xi Jinping's ability because he is not alien to America. Uh, I wrote about uh, in the Minnesota newspapers about uh, Xi Jinping uh, came to Iowa uh, and he stayed with the host family like I did it in, uh, in Minnesota. And he knew about American culture, American views and what the freedom means to them. So I think uh, it take, as you mentioned earlier, you don't need to 200 years or 100 years to figure it out for the Chinese. Last 30 years they uh, marvel the world, what they did it economically. I think next 30 years, by the time they come to the 2049, when they celebrate their founding of the uh, Republic of China, uh, People's Republic of China, uh, uh, 2049, 100 years. So I think by that time, China is going to be a much better place than what they even intend, because China cannot always control the put the balloon down the water uh, because people are yearning for this freedom even the leadership is yearning for that kind of freedom well that's a that's a great uh, optimistic positive note to to end the discussion on and really appreciate your uh, uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with us today and thank you very much uh, professor Mendez a, a great pleasure and and thank you everybody for being with us today yeah, thank you very much Frank okay. yeah. thanks Thank you.